Lord, as we survey that wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, may we truly, Lord, pour contempt on all our pride. May we boast only in that cross as the Apostle Paul said and did. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Well, help us, Lord, to live the crucified life. And may what we study tonight help us to do just that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's get closer here. I turned the light off there so we see the screen better. Okay. All right. One of our main texts is found in Hebrews 4.12. Scriptures, most scriptures will be on the screen. Okay. You can follow along. Or This is very uh, familiar to many Christians. For the word of God is living. King James says uh, quick means living. And active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and of marrow and again that's metaphorically speaking joints and marrow in other words it just gets into the innermost part of our being right? and discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart right? okay let's see here now <clears throat> The Bible uses different metaphors to uh, describe the Word of God. Right? And we know, we just saw here, sharper than a two-edged sword. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Right? So it's a lamp, guides us, illuminates our path. And here's an interesting one, where, uh, is not thy word like a fire? That's contained in the lamp. Okay. But then he says, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Now, a sword is sharp, right? But a hammer is usually blunt. Okay. And so sometimes God's word is sharp and it pricks us quickly. Other times it clubs us, right? It's blunt. Boom. Right? Uh, but they're both metaphors for the word of God. So the word of God can be sharper than a two-edged sword, but also blunt like a hammer. Right? It's not contradicting. It just have, takes different forms, different times. And uh, interesting, with when you look at hammer, I thought of what happened in the parable of the sower when the seed fell on the wayside. That's the hard ground. Jesus explains those seed that fell by the wayside are they that hear... Then comes the devil and takes away the word out of their hearts. Notice, lest they should believe and be saved. What that's telling me is that if the word of God's like a hammer, it can pound that hard ground into dust. And the devil knows it, especially if it rains a little bit. The ground can get soft. Right? God's spirit is like rain, right? like the water. And so the devil knows that even that hard ground, that's a hard soul, can be broken open with the word of God. So that's why uh, we sow the seed. We don't, we say, well, that person's hard-hearted. Okay, sow the seed anyway. Uh, it could, they could be saved. So the devil knows and believes more in the power of God's word than we do sometimes lest they should believe and be saved. Right? So that's the hammer of God's word. And so the word of God here is a sword. Ephesians six seventeen. When we put on the armor of God, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we have so far... We have a lamp. What else do we have? Metaphors for the Word of God. A lamp, a light, a hammer, a fire. 
the sword. Okay. Now let's go back to Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. So it seems to be saying there's something that is some metaphor for the word of God that depicts it as sharper than a two-edged sword. So we just kind of throw off, say, okay, well, there's something out there that's uh, sharper than a two-edged sword. Okay? And so we're asking the question, maybe you can answer it. In the ancient world, <clears throat> was there anything sharper than a two-edged sword? Probably not. Okay. Now the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Well, I think there is. Wesley, you know what it is, right? Get close. The ancient arrows made out of bronze could be sharper than a sword. Okay? And this indeed is a metaphor for the Word of God. Right? Now, here's something from the Theological and Literary Journal of 1849. Arrows denote or represent the Word of God itself, which is sharper than two-edged sword. Okay. So the arrows represent the Word of God, which is sharper than a two-edged sword. And here is a picture of a Scythian bronze arrowhead from 700 BC. And I promised you Dale was going to use the pointer once. And just going to use it once. <laughs> the reason why this could be sharper than a sword is because when you take this out of the... This is old, of course. This is very old and probably dulled. You can bang this these edges down to as sharp as a razor which you cannot do to a sword why I mean you could it's too you fat you could it's thick. yeah it's fat you want a fat why because it will break yeah if you were to take a sword and uh, file this down to a very sharp razor edge which these arrows were it would break in combat because you're hitting other swords you're hitting armor it would just break, it would chip. You couldn't do it. So the ancients would file this down, you know, with a hammer on the anvil when it's still hot, and they would make it as sharp as can be. Right? So there is something sharper than a two edged sword, which is a metaphor for the Word of God in Scripture, and it is an arrow. Okay? These arrows will penetrate armor more than uh, a sword. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Arrows can penetrate. So the point can be sharper. Uh, and of course they they, <clears throat> they attack with more velocity, the arrows. Right? And for greater distances. <clears throat> now let's go to the second book of Kings chapter 13 and see what this <clears throat> means for us. <clears throat> and how this helps us live the crucified life, a godly life, a holy life. This is a beautiful uh, story, and we're going to spiritualize it, as uh, you'll see Charles Spurgeon and others have done. And that's with the prophet Elisha and uh, the king Joash okay, of Israel. 2 Kings 13, 14 through 19 here, then we go on the next page. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. In other words, the chariot is coming down as it did for Elijah, uh, his mentor. Chariot came down and took him away. And so Joash is saying, yeah, uh, the chariot is going to take you away. 
Elisha said to him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, Put thy hand upon the bow. And that's what you do. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. So in other words, what he was about to do was to receive the blessing of the prophet, which was in turn the blessing of God. So Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands, who were upon the bow. And then he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. And Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance. After he shot one arrow, he said, This is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. And the arrow of deliverance from Syria right? so he repeats it twice for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till you have consumed them right? and he said Elisha said take the arrows and he took them and he said unto the king of Israel smite upon the ground which means shoot to the ground and he smote thrice three times and he stayed, okay, stopped. And the man of God was wroth or angry with him and said, you should have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Do you see what we're getting at here? How we can spiritualize this okay, into our Christian living. Charles Spurgeon says, Take your arrows and shoot, referring to Elisha and Joash. And he went to the window and he shot but once, and the prophet was angry and said, Thou shouldest have shot many times, and then thou wouldest have utterly destroyed thy enemies. And says Spurgeon, So we pray, as it were, but little. We ask but little and God gives it. So if we pray for little, he'll give little. The opposite is also true. If we pray for much, he'll give much. Oh, that we would ask much and pray for much and shoot many arrows and plead very earnestly. In other words, as Christians we want to be like Christ. Well, that depends on how much you want to be like Christ and how much time you're willing to put into it and what you're get willing to sacrifice. How low are you willing to go? Jesus went to the lowest. Remember, he became a slave, as we talked about Sunday. Became obedient unto the death of the cross. So, when we ask to be like Christ, we can ask a little bit, I want to be a little bit more like Christ. Like the one guy who came to church one Sunday and he wanted counseling, he went into the room with me and says, I need a little bit of Jesus. I said, you don't want a little bit of Jesus. Okay? He just thought he needed a little bit of Jesus. Sometimes we're fools into thinking that a little bit of holiness is good. Uh, little sacrifices we make are good. It was Ian e. Bounds that said, Satan takes what is good and destroys what is best. And Spurgeon saying here, what is best is that we should ask for much. Much. Pray earnestly. Do you remember what hard thing Elisha asked of Elijah? We studied that some time ago, not too long ago, when we, when we talked about the uh, devil's advocates, remember Elijah said, stay here, stay here a number of times, and Elijah said, no, I'm going with you, and why? He said, you have asked a hard thing, what did he want? He wanted a double portion. A double portion of Elijah's spirit. Why can't we ask for that? Why can't we ask for a double portion of uh, Apostle Paul's spirit. Why can't we ask for a double portion 
of uh, John Wesley's spirit or uh, George Whitfield's spirit. The devil's, oh, don't ask, it's too hard. And Elijah said, you have asked a hard thing. That's not going to stop Elisha. And I think that's why he was mad at Joash because, hey, you ask a hard thing, you might have to keep on asking, you keep on shooting those arrows heavenward, keep on pleading with God, and you can get it. If it's in his will. And it was in the will, we'll see from another commentator, uh, it was not in the will of God that uh, Israel was defeated by Syria. But let's look on. Okay. About the arrows of God. Psalm 45, 5. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Okay. The heart of the king's enemies. Now this is an interesting saying. It's not just in our heart, because we're not enemies of the king. We are now friends of the king. We are now sons and daughters of the king. But it's in the heart of the enemy. And what are the enemies? Here are three of the biggest enemies. And probably all the enemies of God fall into this category. John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And again, John is writing to believers, and he's saying, hey, don't love the world. Why? Because we can. We can fall in love with the world. Paul said, Demas has forsaken me, loving this present world. Okay. He was a co-worker with the Apostle Paul. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't love the world and love God. You cannot serve two masters. Remember, a slave doesn't serve many masters. A slave has one master. And if you make yourself a slave of Jesus Christ, and that's the word doulos, you have one master. There's one master. And so the love of the Father, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world, and here are the enemies of God. And into the heart of these enemies, God shoots his word, the arrows of truth, into the lust of the flesh. Sensual, fleshly, sinful desires. The lust of the eyes, okay, covetousness, right? Discontentment. Right? And then the pride of life, which is the things in life that make us proud. Okay. And I can think back in my life that I sinned in all those ways as a believer. Okay. And they're still in there with me. And I need to read God's word, to cry over God's word, so those arrows go into the heart of the lust of the flesh. Not in the extremities of it in the heart of the lust of the eyes, not in the extremities of it, in the heart of my pride. Okay. And that's what God's arrows are meant to do. They are sharp. Charles Spurgeon said, I wish you would put yourselves into God's place for a few minutes and just think how you would feel if others had treated you as you have treated him. Now, I'm going to have to think deeply about that, and very honestly, of course. Let the sharp arrows of conviction stick fast in your conscience as you realize that you have acted in a mean, dastardly, ungenerous, ungrateful way towards God, the tender, loving, gracious creator, preserver, the friend of men. You see, the lust of the flesh the pride of life or the lust of the eyes which are enemies of God are also sins against God they are sins against God remember when the prodigal son came home to his father he said father I have sinned before you and heaven which was God right? and 
the prodigal son sinned with the lust of the flesh he was impatient give me my inheritance now he couldn't wait that's lust of the flesh okay he had the lust of the eyes he spent his inheritance on foolish things he saw that he bought it so that woman he took her right as the older son said he spent his living with harlots okay lust of the flesh lust of the eyes and then there was the pride of life he traveled far away from his father I don't need my father anymore I don't want to be under his care anymore that's pride the pride of life so the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life are sins against God directly right? and that's why Spurgeon said we must think of how we have treated God okay. now we read in Job 6 4 that not only are the arrows of God sharp they are poisonous okay. Job 6 4 for the arrows of the Almighty are within me said Job the poison whereof drinks up my spirit or my spirit drinks it up the terrors of God do set themselves in array against me why would the word of God the arrows of the Lord be considered poisonous to Job what is poison meant to do to kill it can do it slowly or it can do it quickly in other words the old nature in us has to die we'll always have it but the poison of God's word of God's truth deals with it as an enemy slowly putting it to death remember when someone was crucified on the cross they did not die immediately Jesus died in how long a time you know six hours but usually it took 24 or, or longer for a person to die on the cross when we put our sins upon the cross with Jesus it takes time for not the forgiveness of sin that's immediate but for the removal of those tendencies and thoughts in our heart and that's poison the, tr the word of God poisons that now in 1 Corinthians 11 we have uh, the words of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church about partaking in the Lord's Supper and I say this because of something Thomas uh, Watson writes which, which I'll show you afterward therefore whosoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord that's like a blunt hammer okay bang okay you cannot take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself again a hammer okay or an arrow or a sword or a fire okay this is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep but if we judged ourselves we would not come under judgment when we are judged by the Lord we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world so here are instructions about taking the Lord's Supper of how to do it and it was Puritan preacher Thomas Watson that said we are to pray that this great ordinance of the Lord's Supper may be poison to our sins so it's not just taking the elements that's not poison but as the Word of God describes, taking it worthily, thinking of Christ's sacrifice, yielding our lives to Him. It is poison to our sins and food to our graces. How long must I wrestle, says David, with my thoughts 
and every day have sorrow in my heart, how long will my enemy triumph over me? Okay. And again, uh, as Christians, sometimes we overcome sin and sometimes it overcomes us. If you lose your temper, unnecessarily, you've been overcome by sin. If you gossip, and I was just gossiping about someone the other day to my wife. I shouldn't have said it. Who was it? <laughs> Unnecessary. Okay? And I cry with David. How long will this enemy triumph over me? Could be vanity in your life. Okay? You name it, right? You name it. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So David's saying, how long is this going to take place? Remember the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7. Okay? The things I hate to do, I do. The things I want to do and love to do, I don't do. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? He was saying, Lord, how long do I have to put up with this? This is not how God... God does not want His people to be wretched. He doesn't want us to be in a tug of war constantly. He wants us, as the Apostle Paul said, to bring the body into submission, subjection. Okay. That's what he wants it to be. And that's what we're working for as Christians. That's why we need so much to devour the Word of God, to let the arrows fly where God shoots them. Right. So David's saying, how long will my enemy triumph over me? And we see come to number three. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presses me sore. Okay. Why do you think God's arrows have to stick fast? Again, thine arrows, God's arrows, in David, stick fast. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, they have, it, it goes deep, it sticks in, it doesn't just glance off. Right? The hunter doesn't want his arrow to glance off uh, the target, the prey. He wants it to sink in. He wants it to stick fast. Uh, the animal can shake it out. We try to shake out, okay, maybe conviction of the Holy Ghost. We may try to shake out uh, something that God uh, speaks to our heart about. Well, that's not for me. That's for brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, but that's not for me. No, it sticks fast. God wants that word to do its job. It sticks fast. The arrow from the hunter sticks fast, so the prey will die. Right? It sticks fast in us. Psalm 32, 4. We see this is what David saying, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. Day and night. My strength was sapped, as in the heat of summer. Okay? For day and night day and night, night and day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade if it has to be. That's how much God loves us. To bring us to a holier life. A life of further dedication. We must never think for a moment that we're dedicated enough. That we're holy enough. That's when we begin to go backwards. Uh, as uh, the ancient divine brother Lawrence said, if you're not going forward, you're going backwards. Okay. So we're almost seeking higher ground, going forward. We're swimming upstream. You give up, stop paddling your canoe, it's gonna, cur current's going to push you right back again. So these arrows are meant, they are sharper than a two-edged sword. In fact, the arrows of the Lord are spoken of more than the lamp, the fire, and the, and the other. Sp speak, spoken of more than that. The arrows of the Lord. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. Number four, go to Lamentations chapter 3, verse 13. He has caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my heart. Okay? Now we read from Psalms 45, I think it was, where the arrows go into the heart of the enemy. 
but also to our heart. Okay? Because our heart, until it's fully Lord's, can produce darkness and sin, even though we have new hearts. Okay? Uh, they're hearts of flesh, the Bible says. I'll take away your stony heart, which has no feeling at all for God, and give you a heart of flesh. But it's still a heart of flesh. It's soft, but it needs to be protected. That's where we wear the breastplate of righteousness to cover our heart. Okay? The word reins in the King James means heart. Some translate it as kidneys or liver. or It really means the um, vitals in you. Okay? Your vital parts. So that God, his arrows are accurate. Okay? They're very accurate. Now you can have a sharp arrow and you can put poison on it. Okay? And if you're hunting for that big buck and you, you hit the back of his tail, well, you've done nothing. Okay? Even the poison won't work. So God's arrows are accurate. So when you read the word of God, Remember, he's targeting your heart. And he's targeting the heart of his enemies. That may be within us. He has caused it to enter into my heart. Second century uh, church father, Tertullian, he said, For after the Lord ascended into heaven and opened all things, he sent the Holy Spirit, whose words the preachers send forth as arrows, reaching to the human heart that they might overcome unbelief. Okay. And those arrows, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, right? So the more we spend in the Word of God, seriously, not, not, not glibly looking over it. You know, my cousin John and I, we had a contest. Who could read the most uh, chapters in the Bible that day and we come together at night this is when he lived at the fellowship house uh, or nearby, I forgot now where it was and, oh I read more than you John oh I read more than you Paul okay. we weren't reading for spiritual edification okay. we had a contest going so we want to read the word of God faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God why the heart? because of what our heart's supposed to do Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. It was Martin Luther that said in the middle of his fantastic career as a reformer, he said, I don't think I've begun yet to love God with all my heart. Okay? It's something we work at. Something we progress to. Sanctification. Loving God with all our heart. So, there are things in our heart that need to die so we can love God with all our heart. Remember what Jesus said, that we must love him more than mother or father or uh, son or daughter or even our own life or we cannot be his disciple. Fifthly, God's arrows come unexpectedly. Psalm 64, 7. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded. A person comes to church. They're feeling good and happy, rejoicing. And then they hear the pastor speak about the need to repent. Okay, All of a sudden, sudden. And they need it. Maybe they need repentance, but that's not what they wanted to hear. So, so suddenly the arrow strikes them into the heart of the enemy, into their heart, poisoning the sin that's in them. Right? God's targeting. Sometimes he does it stealthily, suddenly, quickly, without expectation, as it did in the case of the Saul of Tarsus, who became Apostle Paul. As he neared Damascus on his journey, writes Luke, suddenly a light from heaven flashed round about him. He didn't expect it, he didn't know what it was. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Okay. It was unexpected. Okay. 
And we thank God for those times when unexpectedly he shoots us with an arrow of truth to remind us, to convict us, to chasten us, to encourage us. The arrows also encourage. You know, it's encouraging to know when God targets the enemy in me, the heart of my enemy, that's encouraging to me because I can't get there. You can't get there. You know, we just, oh, it's not too bad. It'll be okay, you know. It's like having a, a pet tarantula living in your shirt. Oh, it's okay. It's my pet, you know. Or a black little spider till it bites you. And so, um, it's encouraging when God says, you know, I love you so much and I want to rip out of you, either with a club, okay, or a sword, or an arrow, or fire, or lead you with a lamp away from that. So sometimes it comes suddenly. Sixthly, lastly, Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 11. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation at the light of thine arrows. They went and at the shining of thy glittering spear. And that glittering spear and that light of your arrows is lightning. We read on here. Thou didst march through the land. We see why God sent his uh, glittering, how, how do you call it there? Uh, I have a cook here. It is. The light of thine arrows, and also called it a glittering spear. The light of thine arrows. It's lightning. Why? Why did he you know, send lightning bolts? And why does the Bible call them arrows? Like uh, Martin Luther said, he preached lightning bolts. When he would preach, lightning bolts would come out of his eyes. You know, Not real. It was the word of God. And it struck people. And people were c- converted. They changed. Hab- Habakkuk, we see why God uses lightning as an arrow. Metaphorically. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Now again, the lust of the flesh is not a friend of God. Never can be. The carnal mind is an enmity of God, the Bible says. And can never be anything else. The worldly mind is an enmity with God. The spiritual mind is at peace with God. Right? So he marches through the land. He goes through our heart. He searches the reins of our heart. He knows it. And with indignation, not against the believer, but against the sin in him. The only time God ever embraced sin was on the cross. He's embraced sinners, but the only time he ever embraced sin was when he took it on himself at the cross. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. Even for salvation with thy anointed, that's the Messiah, the anointed, the Christ. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. And so we see again God's headed to the heart and to the head. Okay? David chopped off the head of Goliath. Right? Why? For the salvation of God's people. The Lord has thundered in the heavens, says David. And the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. Those are the enemy. He flashed forth lightnings and he routed them. He routed them. So why is this arrow of the Lord likened to lightning? Well, have you ever been in a lightning storm? It, for a couple of seconds, everything's lit up. It's like daylight. Okay. You know that uh, a bolt of lightning is six hundred times brighter than the surface of the sun. That's how bright a lightning bolt is. Six hundred times brighter than surface of the sun. Why? Well, Pastor James Wells says, what are the lightnings? Why God's word? 
his arrow shall go forth as lightning. Whether it be to strike an Ananias and Sapphira dead. Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. Suddenly the, light, the bolts, lightning came, the sword came, the arrows came. Right? Not to save them, but to judge them. Whether it be to strike an Ananias and Sapphira dead, or to pierce the hearts of 3,000 sinners at Pentecost and make them cry, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Whether it be for judgment or for mercy, these lightnings are God's word. All the arrows that we've talked about are God's word. And then there are thunderings, because usually with lightning and thunder, you have they go together. What are the thunderings? Why God's word? Again, the child of God sometimes gets rather sleepy. Some thundering scripture will come into his mind, create fears, such as, without holiness no man shall see God. Okay. Those that willfully sin lose their sacrifice for sin. These are some scriptures that come to mind that, like thunder, they create fear and doubts and tremblings. This is what one calls being called into the secret places of thunder, but it does the soul good, says Pastor Well. Six hundred times brighter than the service of the sun, a bolt of lightning is. Uh, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was praying, and Luke writes, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. As bright as a flash of lightning. I'm going to end with a quote from Albert Barnes. And this has to do again with Elisha and Joash. The unfaithfulness of man limits the goodness of God. Though Joash did the prophet's bidding, it was without any zeal or fervor, and probably without any earnest belief in the efficacy of what he was doing. Do we realize the efficacy of our prayers? Or do we pray with unbelief? Do we waver like something tossed on the sea, as James says? Probably without any earnest belief in the efficacy of what he was doing, God had been willing to give the Israelites complete victory over Syria, but Joash, by his non-acceptance of the divine promise, in its fullness had checked the overflow of mercy. And the result was that the original promise could not be fulfilled. And if that's not true, then Elisha the prophet was wrong. And we don't want to start going there. Okay? The, oh, the prophet shouldn't have said that. No. The prophet said, if you had shot more, you would have defeated them. You would have consumed them. So, when it comes to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, we should be desiring to consume them in truth. Consume them with God's righteousness. Consume them by grace. They'll still be there. But we'll have dominion over them rather than they over us. So the arrows of the Lord are sharp. They're poisonous. They stick fast. They're accurate. They can be unexpected. And they are as lightning. Right. Any questions or comments? Anything you want to share? Ever been struck by lightning? No. Probably haven't been, right? Except when you read the word of God, you might be struck by lightning, right? And that's happened to me. It's like a bolt of lightning crashing down. Wow. I had to read it over again, over again. It was amazing, right? And it wasn't always sweet. You know, to be struck by lightning, 
you get burned and uh, many of the ancients like the ancient Persians and some of the American tribes indigenous tribes they would poison their arrows okay, to hasten the death of their victim so if a person's a bad shot gets their buffalo in the hind quarters if it's poisoned it might eventually slow him down and kill him right? so God wants to uh, slow down the work of the old nature in us begin to uh, consume it right? and it can go on little by little but it's the work of God's truth, his word alright let's close in prayer Father we thank you for your arrows of truth thank you Lord that they together with the hammer and the fire together Lord with that sword all being your word all synonymous with the word of God that they are meant to save us deliver us bring us to heaven and as the scripture says how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation if the righteous barely are saved where will the sinner and the ungodly appear that's why we need you daily Lord and help us as Spurgeon said to ask hard things to ask for much if you give us little when we ask for little we know you will give us much when we ask for much we want more of your spirit in us more of the mind of Christ more desire to see lost people saved Lord if we're not going forward we are going backwards to stand still Lord is not in your plans you either want us cold or hot but not lukewarm we pray Lord these words today from your holy scriptures will help us to seek a more crucified life a life more like Jesus Christ and we do pray this in his holy name he's the only one that makes it possible Jesus name Amen <laughs>